I just want you to remember that, <clears throat> what we just sang uh, while, we, while we studied the book of James, because you're going to need to remember that. It's, um, it's amazing. Uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned to you last week, we ended up Philippians. We closed Philippians last week. Um, how many of you think you received something from Philippians from the Lord? You did, did good. All right, good. About four or five. Yeah, I praise the Lord. All right, well, hallelujah. <laughs> four or five. Glory to God. All right, that's better than that. But <laughs> I, had a, I enjoyed it. I really did. And uh, had an opportunity, I think, for us to see some things and to deal with some things uh, scripturally, theologically, and um, as Christians that we, we don't often get to, you know, move into those areas of life just naturally. James will give us another opportunity to do this because James is a tremendously great book. It's a very concrete book. It's, uh, it's very practical. Everything in it is practical. It doesn't deal with any big highfalutin fancy things that are out there in the ethereal somewhere. Book of James is right down to earth, right where you live, and right in your face. Believe me, it is, uh, it is unbelievable. It's one of the first books, one of the first New Testament books written, actually. Uh, I know that when you read your Bible, the book of James is after Hebrews, which is toward the back of your Bible. You know, there's only, let's see, the Johns and Peter and Revelation and Jude back there after James, if I'm not mistaken. And so it seemed like the book of James would be toward the end of things, you know, of the New Testament writings and so forth. But it's not. It's one of the first. Uh, it was actually before Paul did any of his writings or anything like that. The Gospels were there. But it's a very, in other words, it's, it's a book written at a time where the gospel hadn't gone to the world yet. The gospel was still primarily among the Jewish people that were being saved and coming to the Lord and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, James did a great deal to talk about what Christianity was like. <clears throat> and uh, it's a very, if you want to put a little title, if you had a Bible and you wanted to write in it and you want to write underneath the book of James, you could put practice what you preach, you know, or behave like you believe. James says there's two kind of people in this world, two kind of believers in this world. There are those kind that talk about what they believe, and that's about all they do is talk about it. And then there are those kind that talk about it and then live out what they talk about and let their life prove what they live out. There's been a little bit of theological uh, dealings over the years, over the centuries, and uh, with the book of James and the writings of Paul, you know, because Paul's main theme was the just shall live by faith and that you're saved by faith, by trusting Christ, by faith in Jesus. And then James' book, you know, the main verse, if you wanted to call it, there, every verse in James is great, but, but uh, if you want to have a focus verse for the book, it would probably be in the second chapter in the 20th verse where he says, um, uh, faith without works is dead being alone. And so if, you're, if you really want to try to look for something to cause a little controversy, you can say, well, James is saying that we're not saved by grace, we're saved by works. But that's not at all what he's saying, and you'll see that by the time we do it. James believes, just like Paul, that Jesus Christ comes into your heart when you believe him, and faith saves your soul. Faith in Christ saves your soul. But what James is saying is that any faith that is strong enough to save your soul is strong enough to produce a life that lives like it believes. And Yeah, right. In other words, don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you believe. And so the book of James is the show me book, the, the practice what you preach book. Uh, I call it uh, walk the talk, you know. Yeah, yeah, we talk a lot. And, uh, and, and so the scripture says here in the book of James that, that God is interested in not only people who do a good deal talking, but actually live out what they, what they, what they say they believe. And let's just start with the first verse. And the first question of the book comes in the first verse and the first word, and it says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts with James. Which James? The Bible has about four Jameses that are mentioned in the New Testament. And so which one is this? Well, you have James that is the father of Judas, one of the disciples, the one that, you know, betrayed Christ and so forth. He's mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament uh, by name, but he's never mentioned as a follower of Christ or a believer. So it's, a, it's, 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 it's not James, the father of Judas. And then James, the son of Alphaeus, which uh, he appears on the scene for a very brief period of time. Uh, he's the brother of Matthew, one of the apostles, Matthew. 
Uh, he's mentioned a couple of times, but then, you know, he, he just kind of appears like a flash and then he's gone. So it's unlikely that he would be it. And then there's James, the older brother of John, the, the thunderstorm boys. You know, James and John, the sons of thunder that were the disciples of Jesus. And they were rough, rough, tough, waterfront fishermen that came to Christ, got saved. And uh, they stayed pretty tough. They were the ones that when one city didn't want to receive Jesus, they said, Lord, you want us to just call fire down on them? Let's burn them up. And Jesus thought that might be a little, little rude, you know, so he, he settled them down. It's, uh, but, but, uh, but that James was killed, was martyred by Herod about 10 years before the book of James was ever even written. So that obviously can't be him. So who is it left? Well, we know who it is. We have great confidence. It's James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus. Yeah, Jesus had a half-brother. As a matter of fact, he had four of them and had at least two sisters because the Bible talks about them in plural form and sisters. One day, Jesus was, um, shall we say, entertaining a group of theologians. But yeah, he had at least two sisters. They're mentioned uh, because they were part of the group that was standing outside the room. His brothers and his sisters, the Bible says were standing outside of the room listening to what was going on on the inside because they thought they might have to go in there and get Jesus out of there because they thought maybe, you know, he had kind of lost himself a little. You know, I mean, he was, they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe he was the Messiah until after the resurrection. That's just an unusual thing. You, you know, Jesus was born in a normal family, right? I mean, Jesus was the first child born in the family, and he was born when Mary, his mother, was a virgin. He had a mother and a father. Of course, uh, Mary was a virgin, and the Holy Spirit uh, impregnated Mary with a seed from heaven, from God. It was Jesus, and she had Jesus, but that's not all the children she had. After she had Jesus, she had Jesus. Is, I mean, they're mentioned in the New Testament by name, the four brothers that he has. And then the sisters are mentioned, you know, as a, as a form of being more than one. So we know at least there were at least six kids in the family. And, uh, and Jesus grew up in a normal home with a normal mom and dad, with brothers and sisters. They played little games out there, you know, and hide and seek and kick the can and, you know, uh, mumly peg or whatever it is they were playing. And... Um, and Jesus just grew right. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, James, his half-brother, uh, was probably amazed at the fact and probably a little confused at the fact that Jesus never seemed to get angry at the other kids, you know, and Jesus never seemed to criticize. There was no nanny, nanny, nanny from Jesus, you know, and so they could probably all tell that there was something unusual about this Jesus, but as a child, he grew up in a normal home with a normal childhood. And all the Bible says is that he grew in stature and wisdom and found favor in the eyes of God. And that he went home and obeyed his parents. And we never see Jesus again until he gets about 12 years old and they take him to the temple. And, uh, and, and they're going to do some, some ritualistic Jewish things at the temple when he's 12 years old. And I've had people actually say, well, pastor, I don't think we ought to baptize children until they get to be 12 years old. And my question would be, well, why do you believe that? And they say, well, Jesus went to the temple when he was 12. Well, there are, well but here, he didn't go to be baptized, and your child ain't Jesus. So there you go. <laughs> so come on, bring them in. When they're old enough to know that they sin, they're old enough to be saved. I'm serious. If they're old enough to recognize they're a sinner, they're, all, they're old enough to come to the Lord. Uh, but Jesus, you know, lived the normal childhood and so forth. And so I'm sure that it must have been... Um, uh, uh, growing up with Jesus must have been, a, a, you know, a, one of those things where you, you just knew something was different, but you just really didn't know what was different because there was no announcement about it. There was no banner over the, over the house. This is the house where the Son of God lives, you know, that kind of thing. And so the brothers and sisters just grew up with Jesus just like you would grow up with your brothers and sisters and all of that. And then one day, James was with Jesus, I'm sure, when... Uh, Jesus went into the city, and, um, and it was said that John the Baptist was out at the river baptizing people in the Jordan River, and, and then Jesus said, hey, I'm going to get baptized by John the Baptist. And his brothers and sisters probably said, what? What are you getting baptized? And then, um, to their amazement, imagine, in this little tiny city, you know, where they lived, it, the rumor went everywhere when Jesus was baptized that something strange happened, that there was a dove that came down and lit on Jesus' shoulder, and there was this voice that came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 
which is remarkable seeing that Jesus hadn't done anything yet. I mean, really, this was right at the start of his ministry. He hadn't performed any miracles. He hadn't done any wonders. He hadn't taught on the mountain. He hadn't done anything. But God, yet God looks down from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm well pleased. We dads could take a tip from God about that kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. When's the last time you said that to any of your children? So I, you're, you're my beloved son and, and I'm well pleased with you. No matter what happens, right? But anyway, I'm getting off the beaten path. James, um, so James, you know, is, is living through this. And, and then when he goes to the temple, to the synagogue, I'm sure James was just very confused when, when Jesus starts reading out of the book of Isaiah in the synagogue. If you, if you want to read it when you get home, Isaiah 61, and it's a very, it, it just talks all about what Jesus was, actually. And when he got through reading in the synagogue, he looked out at all the people there, and Jesus said, and this very day are these scriptures fulfilled in your ears. And I'm sure that James must have begun to consider and concern himself about what was going on with his brother? Did his brother have a, you know, did his brother have a complex? Was he mentally ill? Uh, what was going on with Jesus? Because this is my brother. This is the this is the guy I grew up with. This is this is the one we played little childhood games about, and Jesus was the example of my life. And so he must have been questioning all in his life about. What was life like and what, will, what does this mean? It, but it took a long time for his brothers and sisters to come to grips with the fact that their brother, their half-brother, Jesus, was the Son of God. And none of them were believers while Jesus was walking around on the earth. James became a believer, according to the Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, when when Jesus himself personally spoke to James after his resurrection. And then James became a believer that his brother was indeed the Son of God. James became the first pastor of the first Christian church in the city of Jerusalem. The largest Christian church and the fastest growing Christian church I mean, you know, they had 3,000 saved on one day, 5,000 saved the next day, 4,000 saved the next day. James became the pastor uh, appointed by the other apostles, which I think is an amazing thing seeing that James is Johnny come lately. You know, James was not one of the disciples. James was not one of them that was there from the beginning. James was not a believer in Christ until after Christ was baptized. So what it's saying, I believe, about James is that James was a man of tremendous character. James was a man who people believed in. James was a person who, who they put great authority on immediately as if this person is a quality individual, this person is a serious individual. And, uh, and then he became the, the, the president of the council where it was decided about if the gospel was going to go to the Gentiles. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a Gentile. <laughs> yeah, anybody who's not a Jew is a Gentile, right? <laughs> and so there was a council. Did you know this? Did you know that there was a decision made about 2,000 years ago that had it gone the other way, we wouldn't be sitting here today? That had it gone the other way, that life as we know it would be totally different from us? That church would not be church like we know it, and the kingdom would not be the kingdom like we know it had a decision gone the other way. And I'm thinking to myself, imagine, imagine if somebody else had been leading that meeting, because I've led a lot of meetings, and I've been in a lot of pastoral and spiritual meetings. I can understand what happens in these kind of meetings like this. There were some of those guys in there that said, no, uh, we don't believe the gospel. The gospel is for the Jews. God loves the Jews. We're God's chosen people. God gave, Jesus was a Jew. The disciples were a Jew. They were, it was intended for the Jewish people, and we need to, we need to love God and, and, and forget about these Gentiles. And then some of them said, well, you know, if somebody is a Gentile and they come to Christ, then, then they can turn into a Jew. You know, we can, you know, baptize them in and ritualize them in. And, do all. and so there were all of these differing views and opinions coming about what was going to happen. And James stood up in the midst of that as the leader of that whole council and said, men, 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 we're getting off track. We're getting off track. We're getting off track. The question is, are we going to let the gospel go to the Gentiles? Are we going to participate in it? Are we going to be a part of it? And I vote, Jesus Christ said, whosoever will let him come and we're going to go to the Gentiles. And everybody said, well, if you're for it, I guess we're for it. Yay, James. Man, I'm so glad James was led by the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit. 
Hagapus, which is a, and I wrote it in your notes, uh, I don't know him personally. He was a, <clears throat> he was a second century Christian historian, which means anywhere right after about 100, you know. So he's pretty close to the scene. He's pretty close to the time of James. And he wrote about James that James had an unusual nickname. Because James spent a lot of time on his knees in prayer, his knees became calloused like a uh, like a camel. And because he spent so much time praying for the people and, and, and praying for the ministry and the work, uh, they nicknamed him Old Camel Knees. And I don't know about you, but if I'm going to read something after someone and I'm going to try to shape some thinking in my brain about what God wants for me and what God is and what God's about, I would certainly like for it to be somebody like Old Camel Knees. I think I'd like to see what he had to say about serving the Lord and being a Christian and letting your light shine out of you. As a matter of fact, the same Hegapus that, that, uh, that wrote about his uh, nickname also wrote about his death. He was martyred, uh, and, and, and the way he was martyred was he was taken to the pinnacle of the temple on the edge of the temple wall that overlooks this real rocky crag down there, and the brook of Kedron runs down there. And he was taken to that spot, and he was stood on that spot, and, and Herod uh, had him pushed off of that and, and plunged to his death on those rocks below. This is the interesting thing about that. It was the same place that the devil took Jesus years earlier and took him up to the temple and said, Hey, throw yourself off here because the angels have a command. You know God's given them a command, and the command is not to even let you stump your toe. So throw yourself off of here and everybody will be amazed and say, look at that. He's got to be the son of God. It didn't kill him. And Jesus said, get thee behind. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. <laughs> in them only shall you serve. It was that same spot where James was pushed off. But James knew there'd be no rescue for him because the whole crux of the book of James, you know what it's about? It's about what happens in the lives of Christians when they have problems when the trials come, when things don't work like we think they ought to work. You know, I've heard all my life in the ministry that we as children of God have a privilege to go and stand before the Lord and claim victory over problems and sicknesses and illnesses and, you know, the, the issues of life and that somehow we can avoid, we can be spiritual enough that that won't happen in our lives. We can be close enough to God that we'll never have to suffer sickness. We'll never have problems. We'll never have the ills of life that others face. And to that, James says, I'll guarantee you that you are going to have problems. I'll guarantee you that you're going to have difficulties in life and that things are going to happen in life that you're going to have to you're just going to have to believe that God loves you. You're going to have to walk through just like we were singing, you know. Uh, he's never going to let me down. He's never going to let me down. You'll have to walk through life saying, he's never going to let me down. He's never going to let me down. I know this looks tough. I know this looks bad. I know this might seem hard, but I know God is in it, and I know he's going to be with me, and I know he's carrying me somewhere, and bless God, even though I can't see where I'm going, and I don't know how long it's going to last, and I don't know where it's going to end, I know God is never going to let me down, and he is good, and he loves me, and everything that happens in my life is filtered through his purpose and his will and his dy dynamic for my life. And so I'm going with God, and it'll give you an inner resiliency in your life. It'll give you an inner strength in your life that helps you be able to cope with the issues that certainly are coming in life. And so James, the half-brother of Jesus, not bragging. I mean, James, just think, James, what James could have said, I am James, the half-brother of Jesus. He could have claimed some notoriety from that, right? I mean, he was kind of famous. I am James. I've been with the Lord. He's my brother. Applaud, you know. But James just simply says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. No bragging in James. No ego in James. Simply that bond servant of the Lord 
the bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, who am I writing this to? I'm writing it to the 12 tribes that are scattered. The 12 tribes are the 12 tribes of Israel. And I'm sure you know all their names, right? Simeon, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, Issachar, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, Gad, and Reuben. All the boys. It says the scattered tribes because they are scattered. If you were to talk to a Jewish person today, now, I mean, they'll prob- some of them probably think they have all of the lineages figured out and so forth and which tribe they're from and all that. And some of them have names that would probably give an indication that you might be from the tribe, you know, of Levi or you know, something like that. But in all honesty, in all honesty, no Jewish person today can tell you for sure, for certain, what tribe they're from. Because they've been scattered all over the earth. It's only since 1948 that the Jewish people have been back in Israel. For all of those centuries, they were scattered abroad over all the earth in every country of the world, in every place in the world. There was no, there was no Israel. Israel had been destroyed. Israel had been gone. The Jewish people, as a matter of fact, when we get into the book of Revelation and some of the prophecy teaching, which I'm going to start in January, so get ready for that, the book of Revelation. And uh, we're going to go all the way through just like this and like we did Philippians and others. And we're going to see what God has to say to us because I believe God's got something to say to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, believe, I believe that he's going to speak to us about some things and that we need to, we need to know. Yeah. And so if you, in, in, with the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, they're scattered and they don't know and, uh, who they belong. And, 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 and James says, I'm writing to them because uh, you need to know that God hadn't forgotten you and that God has a word for you. And when I think about those scattered tribes, you know, they, they're lost to us. They're, they're called the lost tribes of Israel, actually. But they're not really lost because God knows every one of them, right? God knows which, who belongs to what and to every one of them. Because if God could lose some of his Old Testament people, he could lose some of his New Testament people, right? And God doesn't lose us and God doesn't know us. And so here's James writing and saying, now I'm writing to all of you. You know, we Christians, we're like the scattered tribes of Israel. Yeah. We, we come in here one time a week on Sunday morning to get a little instruction, and then what happens to us the rest of the week? We're scattered out there. What does the Bible say we are? We're the, we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And then we come back next Sunday and get a little bit more instruction, and then we're scattered out there all over creation. So James says, all right, bond servant of Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. He says, you're going to need to know some information. You're going to need to know some things about your life and about what you're going to face. So let me give you you just some insight. And James starts with verse 2, and he starts... He tells, he tells us in verse 2, and you will read it in just a second. Listen, there's a reality that every one of us must realize, and that is that trials are going to come. That's right. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to get tested. You're gonna get, there are going to be trials in your life. That's a guarantee from God. Now, just as sure as you're sitting here this morning, that's, that, that is exactly what's going to happen. And so James in verse number 2 says, Uh, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Notice that James does not say, if you fall into various trials. He says, when you fall (laughs) into various trials. And the word trials is 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 an attempt to interpret the word parismos, which I've already made fun of all Greek people, so Greek-speaking people, so... Now I'm becoming a hypocrite by quoting one. Parismo, you know what parismo means? It means, it's, from the, it's the word from which we get our word pirate. So what is this verse saying to us? What is James saying to us? James is saying that we're all going to face trials that come like pirates. Pirate is an unexpected uh, I know we don't deal with pirates anymore because we don't travel the seas and, and we have communication and all that. And there are a few pirates around different places. But, but in, the, in the days of pirates, a pirate would just swoop down upon a ship. It would just like be out in the clear, almost clear ocean. And then, and then all of a sudden there would come a pirate ship and it would com- become completely out of the blue and completely unexpected. And just before you know it, it would just be, it would be completely up, up, upon you. And so James is saying, this is how the trials of your life are going to come. They're going to come like a pirate ship. 
which really makes them a test, actually. Because some of the greatest tests in life, to me, are the tests where you walk into the classroom, and I always hated to see this. We would walk into the classroom. This was the days before electronics were really big. And we had blackboards on every wall. And we had maps and charts and stuff on every wall. And the teacher would have the map pulled down over a certain section of the blackboard. And we all knew what that meant. In just a few moments, she would go over or he would go over and reach that little ring on the bottom and just pull that little thing down like that little flick and let it go in against the top to reveal the questions. You had a pop test. Why did why why they give pop tests? To see if you were keeping up every day, right? So in my opinion, the greatest test, if you want to really test somebody, would be these pop tests where they don't know it's coming. It just all of a sudden comes upon you, and then you can see, okay, are you keeping up? A test that you prepare for is not really a test at all, is it? it? It's an examination. I mean, you're examined, you know it's coming, you study for it, you prepare for it, you get ready for it, and then you're given the test, and then uh, that examines, is, where do you know it? But, but what makes it a test is, and what I'm trying to get to is, that the only way something is really vital and considered a test in our life is if we don't know it's coming. If we're not prepared, so to speak, for the fact that we need to get ready for something to come. And according to James, look, you are going to have tests when you fall into these tests, these various trials, and, and the trials is, 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 are those issues in life that, that find out if we're what we say we are. Um, the only reason God would put us through a test is so that we can know some things, so that we can get some things settled, so that there can be some issues in our life because these tests, these trials that come into our life are, are, are designed for us specifically. What might be a trial to you might not be a trial to me, right? What might be a trial to me might not be a trial to you. So God sends trials into our life and allows trials to filter into our life. Why? so that he can test certain things of our life, so that he can put certain things, uh, bring them to the forefront so that we can be ripened and matured in life. You know, sometimes our faith is green. I don't, and, and it needs to be matured and it needs to be ripened and we need to be able to grow and we need some strength in our life and we need certain things to be true about our life and there needs to be some issues settled in our life and solved in our life. And so James says, look, get ready for it because these trials are going to come. And he says, not only are they going to be trials, they're going to be multiples of them. Uh, not to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, but you do notice that the word trials is plural, Right? Uh, how many of you are aware that trials never come in ones? <laughs> they always come in bunches, right? Now, usually whenever one trial comes, you can always expect another trial to come closely follow. So trials are not only individualized, they're like synchronized with each other because one leads to another that leads to another. Uh, uh, you have bad health. Because you have poor health, it affects your ability to work. Because you can't go to work, uh, it affects your finances. Because you don't have the right finances that you need, it gets you all emotional about whether you're going to make it in life and have enough money and so forth. Because you get all emotional and like that, and both of you get like that, you and your wife, you end up having marital problems. So one trial leads to another trial, another trial, another trial. And James says, look, get ready for this. Look, you need to know something. You need to, you need to be aware that, that you are going to face trials in life, and that being a Christian is not going to allow you to escape. It's not going to give you an out. God says that these things are going to come to all of us, and they're there for a purpose. And so James says, yeah, just get ready for it. In Philippians 4, he says, uh, 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 last say rejoice in Thessalonians 18, 1 Thessalonians, in everything give thanks. And the only point there I want you to see is, notice what it says. It doesn't say for everything give thanks. It says, in everything. And James says, when we fall into trials, we're not to be thankful for the trial. I've heard that before. You know, well, we're supposed to be thankful for everything. And I'm thinking, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Uh, my wife ran off with the postman. Well, thank God. Glory to God for that. That's a wonderful thing. Papaw got run over by the tractor. Well, glory to God. Wonderful. Uh, 
No, if we were thankful for everything, we'd be thankful for sin. We'd be thankful for rebellion. We'd be thankful for terrible things that happen. So we're not to be thankful for everything, but we're to be thankful in everything. In other words, there can be something on the inside of us that can rejoice and praise the Lord, even though the things around us might not be going all that well. James says, get ready for them because they're coming and it's going to be quick. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to be several of them and they're going to come like pirates in your life. All right. And here's the reason why God sends these trials into our life because we need to know something. What do we need to know? Well, I need to know if I'm real or not. Because, you know, there are people that walk around all the time talking about how much they love the Lord. They come into church. They sing the songs of church. They sing the hymn. They talk about going to heaven when they die, and they're not. And then there are those kind of people that sing the songs, sing the hymn, come into church, talk about loving the Lord, and they are going to heaven. Wouldn't it be a great thing to know before you stood before the Lord whether you're real or not? Well, according to James, what trials do in our life is trials allow us to know something. As a matter of fact, look at what, well, I put the verse, I put the verse. <laughs> look at what it says. Uh, verse three, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Uh, it doesn't say f feeling, <laughs> you know. It, it says you got to know some things. If we're going to make it through the tough times of life, if we're going to make it through things that are hard, if we're going to make it through things that are, that, that are uh, unexplainable to us, it's going to be because of something that we know. Look at what I wrote in your, in your note on your outline. My ability to praise God through the tears when my world's crumbling around me is not because of how I feel. I must know something. What is it that I know as a believer that allows me to rejoice in the midst of the trials? I know that the testing and trials of my life produce patience, and patience has a mentoring, ripening work. Sometimes we're green. Uh, trials demonstrate the reality of, of my faith. If I can endure a trial without falling apart, without quitting church, without coming unglued, without crumbling in my foundation, it proves something about my life. And so James says, look, you, when, when you get in these tough situations of life, you, you've, got, you've got to know some things because if you don't know these things, then, then you're going to fall apart. And if your life falls apart, it proves one thing about your life. It's not real. There's a persevering. There's a testing. There's a hardening. There's a there's a strength that God gives us through these trials in life. The purpose for, for putting gold in the fire is to what? To burn out the impurities of it, right? I mean, if you, if, you, if you put gold in fire, there's one thing you're trying to do. You're trying to decide, is this gold real or not? And, it, and, and as the fire heats the gold and it begins to melt, and then the impurities begin to rise up to the top, uh, the old miners would scoop off the impurities and they would know that it was pure when they could look into, into, the, into the goal and they could see a reflection of themselves. So often the Lord turns up the heat in our life. Why would he turn up the heat in our life? So that he can begin to burn away those things that are in our life that are not part of him so that, that, that the maturity and the richness of our life can to begin to come forward and so that we can know where we stand with the Lord. What is the verse that we always say that we love? Romans 8, 28, that verse. Um, Rome, we know that all things work together for good of those who love God and those that are called according to his purpose. And then it says, the next verse says that uh, those that are called are, pre, are, are, are predestined to be conformed to the image of God. In other words, God has a purpose for our lives. And when we give our hearts to Christ, we tell, we tell God, you can do anything with my life you want to do. And so God begins to do those things. God begins to turn up the heat a little bit. God begins to allow things through the filter of his will and the filter of his purpose to, to, to in, in, invade into our lives so that our lives can be shaped into the image of his son. Because quite frankly, most of us are not, are not in the image of Christ, especially when we first come to Christ. You remember when you first come to Christ? It reminded me of, uh, uh, I'm not an artist at all. I, I can't even draw a stick man, seriously. Uh, people have said to me before, Pastor, just draw what you see. <laughs> and I'll start trying to draw. 
And I think it's scary. They go, is that what you see? And it's, I can't get, and, and it just, I just can't make it look right. It just doesn't do. Well, so anything artistic really amazes me. But I'm amazed at these people that take these large, gigantic blocks of granite. You know, like you've seen these huge, huge statues of horses and people and, I mean, just gigantic things. And I'm amazed that somebody took a little chisel and just chiseled away at, these, at, these, at this giant granite rock and, and formed that image right there. And the way they say they do that is... They just look at that boulder and they just begin to chip away everything that doesn't look like what they're creating. And I'm saying that when you came to Christ, you looked like a giant piece of granite. And what Christ began to do with you through trials and adversity and struggles and hard times and tough times and rainy days and all the issues that we face in life, what God has begun to do to you is begun to chip away those parts of you that are not like Jesus in order that your life might grow and mature and ripen and begin to reflect an image of God's Son. Because in this world, we are to be the light of the world and we are to be the salt of the earth. And that means that God has a mission and a purpose for us. And in order for us to accomplish this, we got to be tough. Look at your neighbor and say, man, you got to toughen up. Yeah, we got to be tough. And James says, look, I want to tell you something. Not only are you going, because you're a Christian, you're not going to avoid these issues of life. Because you belong to Christ doesn't mean that your bills are always going to be paid and they're not ever going to come repossess anything from you and, and your children aren't going to sick, aren't going to get sick and have to go in the hospital and some people are going to die and others are going to you know, be well. I mean, there are issues of life. And James says, get ready, realize this, that in your life, trials are going to come. And the reason they come in your life is so that you can know some things. So that whenever you, as you live life forward, you're not torn apart by feelings and everything has to, you know, be your way or you go all to pieces and you can't cope and you don't know what to do and you're torn up and you, you know, no one can depend on you and you're flighty and you're here one minute and gone the next. And uh, this is not God's purpose. And so James says, listen, this is why God sends trials in our life so that we can grow up and mature and ripen and become responsible Reflectors of the glory of God. And then one, one other thing, let me give it to you. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We have some resources that we can rely on according to James, and that is that God's going to perfect our life so that we lack nothing. What in the world is James talking about here? Well, let me read the next verse and you'll see. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. Ask God, if, 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 if I need what, I'm supposed to ask God. If I need an explanation as to what's going on with my life and why these things have come into my life and I need wisdom about the trial, that's what he's talking about. You need wisdom about the trial that you're in. You can ask God, and when you ask God, God's going to give you an answer. He's not going to upbraid you. Well, that's uh, without reproach. Oh, King James word was, and he upbraids not. That just simply means God's not going to make fun of you. God's not going to mock you. When you ask God and say, God, why in the world is this happening to me? And what is this going on? And what do I need to learn from this? And how can I see this in the light that you would have me to see this in? It says God's going to give you that answer because, because God is good, like the verse we sang, and God loves you, and God wants you to be fulfilled, and God wants you to make it through this trial, and God wants you to feel that you're not alone, and that he's never left you, and he, he's never forsaken you, and that he's going to carry you through. And so when he, you ask him, he's going to tell you, the answer, he's going to give you the information that you need about the trials of life. So, so that, according to what James says, so that we lack nothing in life. So that our life is not reflected by what we don't have, but by what we do have. So many people in life are not 
their Christianity is not reflected by who they are or what they are. It's reflected by what they don't do and where they don't go and what they don't go. God said, no, your life should be reflected by my living in you, my fulfilling in you, you being in me. And notice that he finishes this little thought, these first eight verses with this. But let him ask in faith. If you're going to ask God, why am I going through this? What's this struggle all about? What are we doing? What do I need to do to respond to this? How do I learn this lesson? Let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. And look at this last verse. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. How many ways? All his ways. Have you ever met anybody that's double-minded? Don't point at them, it's tacky. Um, if you've ever met anybody that's double-minded, it means somebody that just, they want to they run with the rabbits and hunt with the hounds. You know, I mean, they, they want to play both sides of the deal. They don't really have an, an integrity about anything, and, and, and their answers are always based on um, which way they, they feel you want them to answer. And they're just double-minded. They just can't, it's like they can't, they're rocking a stream. They can't make a decision. They can't, and, and, it, and it's very obvious if you've ever met anyone like that. And what does the scripture say about us when we're like this? That we're unstable in all of our ways. Not just our spiritual ways. Not just our church life. But all of our ways. Our finances are unstable. You ever wonder why, man, hey, they, they seem like such a great person, but boy, man, they, their finances are horrible. They're always having things, you know, repossessed. They're having to move every month, every time the rent comes due, and blah, blah. You know, you wonder and you say, what in the world is this? Unstable in all his ways. Family's unstable. Finances unstable. Life's unstable. Resources unstable. Work unstable. Time unstable. Because James says that a double-minded man is this way. And, and see, this is what God, this is why God does, allows these things in our life because he wants our lives to lack nothing. In other words, we shouldn't have to go outside of, 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 our, of our life, of our faith to, to, to need anything. When the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is functioning as it should function, we, we in the kingdom and in the body have the answer and have the supply to all the needs that the church would have, and, and we shouldn't have to go outside for anything, to reach for anything. But in order for that to be true, we have to know some things. We have to, we have to be mature. We have to be right. We have to be, we have to be ready and stable and capable for those things to come. And so here is old camel knees saying, Right off the bat, all right, in life, trouble's coming. Get ready for it. God's going to help you with it. It's going to be a blessing. It's going to end up working to your good. He's going to work things in you. He'll answer your questions, and this will grow you up and make you strong. So the first word right out of the chute in the book of James is, um, hey, guys, get ready for life. Nothing hits harder in life. What is our famous our favorite uh, theologian says, Rocky Balboa, nothing hits harder in life. And it doesn't, does it? Be ready. All right. <music>